Um, it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Samik Roy Chowdhury. Um, he's a graduate of The Ohio State University. He graduated with a degree in molecular genetics in 1998, and then he got his PhD in immunology, followed by his MD at, also at The Ohio State University. He's associate professor of medical oncology at the James Comprehensive Cancer Center and um, Solov Research Center at, at Ohio State. He leads multiple um, clinical trials. He leads the multidisciplinary precision medicine clinic, and he'll explain really what that means in more depth, but really that, that combines precision cancer medicine, diagnostics, technology, computer, and a whole array of experts around the patient. And really the whole idea is to take the, the cancer care to focus around the molecular aspects of the cancer as opposed to the subtype per se. And um, he's, he's led this really internationally and is a, and is a thought leader in this field. Um, He's the uh, leader of the genomics lab there with studying the genetic mutations, and certainly he's been widely funded through um, the National Institutes of Health, American Cancer Society, and many other societies. So um, I've known um, Samik for a long time. I think you're going to enjoy this discussion. So please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Samik Roy Chowdhury to the Garlove Lectureship. Well, it was really touching to see that video uh, and I have to deliver some hope tonight, don't I? Um, that means a lot that you've invited me to come speak to your group. Uh, yeah, that, that was just an amazing video. So what we'll talk about this evening is this idea of precision oncology that Dr. Flynn alluded to, where we can take the molecular or genetic features of one patient and personalize their cancer treatment based on their cancer. And the new ways that we are trying to do this uh, with new discoveries and genetics. Uh, and then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about how telehealth or telemedicine can help us deliver precision oncology. Uh, just a disclosure about, about a company that I work with for one of the trials. So we'll talk about three things. Microsatellite instability, why we need to know what that is. Number two, uh, new genetic changes in a family of genes called fibroblast growth factor receptors, or FGFR. And then finally, how we are trying to use telehealth to bring precision oncology research to individual patients from Columbus, Ohio, to anywhere in this country. So I want to acknowledge my team, who, uh, who as Joe alluded to, includes experts in genetics, computer science, diagnostics, clinicians, all working together for each patient that comes through our clinic to figure out how we're going to bring hope to that person through research. And so we're combining biology, novel genetic findings, computer science, big data, 300,000 patients worth of big data, uh, bringing all that to hone in on one problem, uh, which is to bring hope to that patient. And to kind of simplify this, the way we go about it is to discover maybe a genetic change that we think could be a weak point, a vulnerability in one person's cancer. And when we discover that genetic change, we want to know where it happens, what kind of cancers, how to detect that genetic change, what kind of treatments we might bring to that patient, and then we want to go do it. We want to develop a clinical trial to test that idea and bring therapies to patients. So all of this from the laboratory bench to our computer scientists, to our clinical trial development, our diagnostics development, we try to put in one room. We want the same group of people who have all these diverse uh, to topics and expertise, we want them talking to one another so we can be innovative and creative and, and bring these solutions for those patients. So this is how we're changing this paradigm on the left, which is a cancer-based treatment. So we treat patients with breast cancer or lymphoma in a certain way, but now we're trying to think about other features more than just what it looks like under a microscope based on the genetic features of these patients and stratify and personalize a treatment based on genetic findings in those patients. And so we now do this to a certain extent uh, maybe in a few percent of our patients. And so our goal is to discover more of these genetic findings and bring more novel therapies to patients so we can personalize treatments 
in a better way. So one example that I want to share with you uh, is a patient that we met several years ago in 2015. Uh, she came to us with a cancer that we couldn't diagnose. So it was something called poorly differentiated carcinoma. We didn't know where it started. Uh, she underwent many tests to figure it out. She actually discovered it while she was tailgating for an Ohio State football game. Somebody had accidentally dropped a grill. I don't know how that happens, but they were unloading a grill from the car and it fell on her hip. It turns out that the grill really wasn't the problem. She had something in her bones, cancer. So here you can see a bone biopsy. You could see a metastasis in her skull bone. Uh, you could see that she had metastasis in her, her bowels or soft tissue. She went through chemotherapy, radiation, and then a bowel surgery. And her cancer was still growing. And she had lost 40 pounds. So she participated in one of our early studies for genetics. This is her, this is her uh, Rhonda. She's happy for us to share her story. Uh, we observed something unusual when we did genetic testing of her cancer in, in 2015. She had a lot more mutations than we expected. So mutations are genetic changes in her tumor, not necessarily something she was born with, but in her tumor. And not only does she have many mutations, we now call that hypermutation, they had an unusual pattern. They had what we call a skip. In technical terms, we call that a insertion or deletion, but she had a skip in these mutations. And so with that pattern, we realized that these skips were parts of our genetics that we now call microsatellites. And these are small repeats of the genetic code. So you have G's, C's, and A's, and T's as our alphabet of the genetic code. And her repeats were being miscounted. There was a stutter. And so why was her tumor copying DNA and stuttering and causing these repeats in these microsatellites? And it turns out that the rest of us, and not her tumor, have a set of genes that are the proofreading genes that proofread when DNA is copied. So we call this the mismatch repair system. And so her tumor had a defect in the mismatch repair system. So this helped us qualify her for a new clinical trial at that time in immunotherapy. And here you see on this axis is the tumor shrinkage. So if you go from zero to 50, that's not good. The tumor's growing. And if you go from zero to 50 and 100 down here, that means the tumor is shrinking. Each box on this graph is a patient, and she's one of these black boxes over here on the right. So everybody with a black or blue box had a defect in the mismatch repair system, and they were very sensitive to this immunotherapy to unleash the immune system to try to reject this cancer. And so I'm sharing her story with you, so I've got a good story ending too then. So here's her cancer. This is a metastasis under her breastbone in July of 2016. She receives an IV immunotherapy called pembrolizumab every three weeks as part of the clinical trial. And you can see six weeks later, the tumor is shrinking. And again, in October, 12 weeks later, the tumor is pretty much almost gone. And now I just saw her two weeks ago in my clinic. She's no cancer, complete response, free of disease, off therapy for almost five years now. So pretty remarkable ending for her story. So when that happened for Rhonda, we said, well, who else has this? So this is back to that genomic vulnerability. Now we've seen a vulnerability. Who else has it? How do we detect it? How do we make sure we get this same therapy to more patients like her? So today, in oncology practice, we have three ways to detect this phenomenon that we call microsatellite instability high, uh, a type of hypermutation. Uh, the first is by microscope slides. This is the older technique that we use for patients with colon and uterus cancer or immunohistochemistry. So an absence of a protein could be a sign of microsatellite instability. The next technique we now have is called MSI-PCR. That's still commonly used for colon and uterus cancer. But each of these techniques have some weaknesses. 
where they might be missing patients who are actually microsatellite high, the kind of patient that we have with Rhonda. And so we want to make sure we never miss a Rhonda. And that's how we're now using sequencing approaches or gene sequencing approaches uh, on the right. So microsatellite instability is a PCR test or polymerase chain reaction. It literally measures the length of these microsatellite repeats. It looks at five or seven locations in the genome. There are over a million microsatellites we could be looking at, and this test is just looking at a handful of them. So you can imagine that there could be some errors here in terms of being able to interpret and detect everybody with good accuracy. This is an example of the PCR measurements. Each of these is from somebody's blood, and you can see uh, on, on, on the x-axis is the width of these segments, and down here is the tumor, and you can see there's a band that's a little wider than what's on the top uh, row, and this represents instability. So this is a tumor that's microcellulite unstable. But we're only looking at five regions. And so we thought that a sequencing or gene sequencing-based approach would be better. So when we sought to do that, we realized well, there's a lot of questions that we don't know the answer to still. So how many microsatellite regions should we evaluate? How many qualify you for being unstable or, or abnormal? How does the amount of tumor cells in, in a tumor biopsy affect that? And what algorithm should we be using? There was a couple being developed. Um, and then there were a couple other features uh, others have looked at in terms of the, the length of, of the skipping that happens. Uh, should we use tumor samples? Should we use blood samples? Should we use both? So all of these questions came to mind. And we eventually came up with an algorithm. So this is a computer science PhD student uh, who eventually, after finishing his PhD, went to medical school and is now training, hopefully, to become an oncologist. This is a PhD student, probably 25 years old, developed this algorithm. And he was able to classify tumors that were microsatellite stable versus microsatellite high with good discrimination. With good discrimination. Well, I shouldn't say that. You should never say good discrimination, right? But that's a technical term. So. So here are three other three algorithms that we looked at together, uh, MSINGS, MSI sensor, all the computer scientists have to come up with clever names for their algorithms. Uh, Russell and Esco came up with Mantis. Uh, I can't honestly tell you what Mantis stands for, but it's a clever name, I guess. And so they were able to show that this algorithm, which is now widely used all over the world to classify tumors, a patient's tumor is microsatellite high or microsatellite stable. Basically, it helps us find patients who have a tumor, just like Rhonda, who then could benefit from immunotherapy. Next, Russell took the same algorithm and found 15,000 patients worth of data and said, well, what other cancer types could have this alteration, this, this, this genomic finding, so we know what kind of patients we should be thinking about? And so here, I apologize for these abbreviations, from the left to right, you can see uterus cancer, colon cancer, stomach cancer, uh, adrenal cancer, cervical cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, mesothelioma. Basically, if you look hard enough, any cancer type we now know could eventually potentially have this phenomenon. And even if it's 1% of a cancer, it's a life-changing answer to say that they can now benefit from immunotherapy in a way that Rhonda did. So now, we think that everybody should undergo some form of microcellulite instability testing. Uh, this is Julie Reeser and our research team. We then went on, not only develop the algorithm, to develop a test to, to test for patients uh, uh, by genetic sequencing. Uh, what we selected was the best 100 microsatellites. So instead of looking at five microsatellites, we designed a way to capture and sequence about 100 different microsatellites that we thought were the most predictive of whether or not you had MSI high. Uh, again, we used the Mantis algorithm. So now, as an oncologist practicing, you have a lot of choices, and now comprehensive genomic testing is the norm, uh, and making sure that your test has accurately stated microsatellite instability was properly assessed. Because many times you might see that report, uh, those of you who are looking at these reports, and it might say, MSI not determined. 
that's a problem because if they're microcellulite high, uh, that's something you don't want to miss. So immunohistochemistry can have false negatives, meaning it could say it's negative when in fact it's actually uh, not. Uh, Next-gen sequencing can also have false negatives. Patients with very little tumor in a, in a tumor biopsy, when you do a liquid biopsy today, that's also full of false negatives. If someone does not have a lot of disease to measure from a liquid biopsy, you might also be missing microcellulite instability. So my final answer is that everyone needs some kind of testing for microcellulite instability. And here's a short comparison for those of you who are looking at these tests. So immunohistochemistry, that's the tissue slide that I showed you. The biggest advantage of immunohistochemistry is that even in a tumor sample that has very little tumor in it, you can still look at cells. Microcellulite PCR is probably pretty good for colon and uterus cancer, but we do know that that can have false negatives. And then finally, next generation sequencing approaches, I still recommend a tissue-based approach. Liquid biopsies that have published and shared some of these companies that they do microcellulite instability from a liquid biopsy are not quite good enough yet. They're probably around 60 to 70% sensitive. So here's a more recent patient uh, that I saw uh, who again had an amazing response after two years of immunotherapy, here's a neck mass here. This is metastasis near her spinal cord. Complete resolution of her disease after two years. I just saw her this, uh, two weeks ago, uh, and she continues to be disease-free. Her gynecologic oncologist saw her at the beginning of this and told her that she should be ready to tell her family that she may not be with them anymore that oncologists had not learned about microcellulite instability, I said, you've got a good chance of beating this thing. And so we still have a lot of work to do in terms of education uh, and understanding how important and how you should be swinging for the fences when you see microcellulite instability. In another uh, clinical trial just very recently, we we're starting to see this immunotherapy occur before surgery. So some patients with rectal cancer who may not be able to preserve their rectal function by undergoing a surgery, and they may need an ostomy or a pouch, they can benefit from immunotherapy if they're microsatellite high. So this is an interesting clinical trial that was just reported where 12 out of 12 patients had a complete response, and maybe they could be spared a, a rectum surgery for their rectal cancer. So a lot of exciting things happening for microsatellite positive cancer. So this observation from Rhonda, again, back to 2015, and still today, we're, we're trying to figure out how to find patients with this marker, has taught us a little bit about how the immune system works. So for cancer to even occur in anybody, it means that cancer has found a way to simply evade and hide from our immune systems. So how did it do that? And so we started thinking about this, started thinking about Rhonda, and so let me walk you through a couple things and how we got here. So today, many people are now eligible for the same immunotherapy that Rhonda had gotten. Uh, one example was pembrolizumab. We now have a dozen others just like it. With all these eligible patients, that's almost half of cancer is eligible for such immunotherapy. But it doesn't always work out the same way as it did for Rhonda. So here are all the cancer types. How many actually respond and benefit in the way Rhonda did? Because we want to swing for the fences. Not that many. About 12 to 15 percent. That's too small of a number. But to me, what that means is that's just not the right immunotherapy yet, right? So how are we assuming that this one immunotherapy is the one immunotherapy that's going to work for everybody? That doesn't make any sense. So how is it that everybody's immune system is not working against their cancer. So we thought to figure out if we could find a way to personalize immunotherapy based on genetics. And so can somebody's cancer find a way through a genetic change to hide from their immune system? So as we were thinking about this idea, we'd heard about a, a woman from one of our colleagues who'd been recently diagnosed with cervical cancer. 
they also happen to have lymphocytic leukemia. And our colleague said, hey, what do you think of this genetic finding? And, and this is a finding I hadn't seen before. So this is the gene involved in Rhonda's immunotherapy, PDL1. And this ligand or protein uh, can result in suppression of the immune system. And if we can release that suppression, well, that's how immunotherapy works. But here we saw a patient whose tumor, instead of having two copies of a gene, had what we called an amplification. It had maybe 20 copies. So why did it duplicate all those copies? Is it trying to use that to suppress the immune system? Is that the mechanism? And so we started digging into this. And so this is back to our, our, our modus of operand, op, op, operation. What genomic feature is it? Alterations in the ligand for PD-1, a drug that the industry has been studying for the past 12 years. Uh, where does it happen? Is it a vulnerability? How do we find it in, the, in a haystack? How do we get treatments to patients who have it? And does it work? So are we right about this? And lo and behold, somebody shared a, a story about one of their patients, a case report, a patient with ovary cancer who had such an alteration with the PDL1 or ligand 1. It was a structural variation, which is a complex genetic change involving the gene. And ovary cancer is not a cancer that responds to these immunotherapies for PD-1. And this woman, who was 80 years old, had a complete response, remarkable response. So here we had an exceptional response, a genetic finding, and some dots that we still needed to connect. So our computer scientists gathered some data. We found over 300,000 tumors worth of data, genetics data, storing them on our supercomputer, uh, analyzing them for these two, or, or uh, one gene, but one uh, partner gene, the PDL1 and PDL2 genes. And we saw how many of these patients have this alteration. How do they do? How do they respond to immunotherapy? And so we were able to find almost 500 cases of patients who had what we call a structural variation in the ligands for PDL1 and 2. Now, this is a little more complex diagram. This is the chromosome that PDL1 and 2 live on. There's thousands of genes. If you zoom in here on chromosome 9, uh, this is the position from here to here. This is the PDL1 gene right here. This is the PDL2 gene. And each of these colors represents a different patient. And each line, each color, each line is a patient. Each color is a different genetic change. So some of these are gray, so unclassifiable by us. Some of them are deletions, so a big chunk of DNA is missing. Green is a, a flip or an inversion. And then red is a duplication. And so all of these are happening in patients in the gene for PDL1. And what's interesting about that uh, is it can occur across cancer types. So these are solid tumor cancers. Uh, so from the left to right, you can see lung and breasts are the most common, but they occur across cancer, just like MSI high. Uh, we can see that squamous cell is a, is a variety that's perhaps overrepresented. So we see that in lung cancer and head and neck cancers, but we see it in other histologic subtypes of solid cancers. We also see it in blood cancers, uh, particularly diffuse large B-cell lymphoma on the left, and perhaps disproportionately in NK cell lymphoma, a very rare cancer, uh, but it seemingly is a bit overrepresented here. So these are the patients that have it. It's PDL1 and 2 structural variations. And again, this is just showing you that NK cell lymphoma, again, very rare, as well as some B cell lymphomas seem to be the most common subtypes of lymphomas represented. And so finally, we said, well, what happens to some of these patients? And that's the part where we have some missing data. So we don't know everything about all 486 patients. But for those, we could find records of how they did, how, what kind of therapies they received. Uh, these are all the patients who received immunotherapy with a drug against the PD-1 receptor or PD ligand 1. In this column are people who've had partial responses, meaning the tumor has shrank, 
complete responses, where the tumor has gone away completely. And then this column here is the number of months they went on their therapy. So again, some exceptional responses. So if you have a structural variation involving PDL1 and 2, your likelihood of benefiting is probably closer to Rhonda's than it is any other cancer type. So before we looked at a 12% benefit rate, here we're perhaps looking at about a 50% benefit rate. So these patients are hiding their cancers through this genome alteration. When we look deeper at some of these tumors, they're hot. Hot means that they're inflamed with an infiltrate of immune cells called T cells. And so CD8 T cells and other T cells are enriched, so red versus blue. M1 macrophages is another aspect of being a hot inflamed tumor. And what we've learned about PD-1 immunotherapies is that the patients who have the best outcomes, who are most likely to benefit, tend to have an inflamed tumor microenvironment. Next, we went back to the haystack. We only found 486 tumors out of over 300,000 tumors that we looked at. So one of the things that we, th we, we thought we might be missing is are we able to properly look for these structural variations? And we used a number of techniques. Uh, one was RNA sequencing from one data set, whole genome sequencing from another data set. RNA sequencing is kind of like looking at maybe 1% of the genome. Whole genome sequencing is looking at everything, but much more costly to do. So we had fewer cases to look at. But with a whole genome sequencing approach, we realized we were missing some of these cases that had structural variations, and it's because they occur in regions between the gene. So, so if you're just looking at genes on a comprehensive genomic testing report that you get today, those are focused on the expressed genes, not the non-coding region of the genome. So one of the things we are doing, we're in the middle of doing now, uh, so this is a cartoon. So if this is the gene for PDL1, these boxes represent where current sequencing approaches are looking. This represents where we are now looking. So we're looking at the whole region, all the black spaces between, as well as the space between these genes uh, to look for structural variations. Again, kind of back to the idea of microcellulite instability. We don't want to miss a patient who has one of these alterations. So we've actually now partnered with a company called Merck to develop a clinical trial to test this idea. So this is all retrospective. We're able to look back and see that patients who have a structural variation are more likely to benefit. Now we're gonna test that prospectively. So we're gonna offer patients who have a structural variations, a PD-1 immunotherapy, to test the idea that, well, that's why that person's cancer is able to escape their immune system. So we're excited to do that. Um, one of the things that surprises me is that every drug company we approached, even though they have a PD-1 drug, had never heard of any of these findings yet. Um, and one of the thing, reasons might be that it's hard to detect. So that's why we need genomics detectives and computer scientists in the same room as clinicians working together uh, to find these aha moments. So this is the idea that a genomic alteration in someone's cancer can alter how their body sees that cancer and can find a way to alter immunity, escape immunity, and allow the cancer to grow. So if we can figure out what that mechanism is for a given patient, we can tailor therapy to them. And so there are many ways that drug companies are now developing new strategies, different targets that are encoded by genes, but they don't know what they're looking for. They're just throwing darts into space. So our goal now with a new algorithm that we're developing is to systematically look for what genes are altered, what altered immunity do we see, and then can we kind of reverse the, pharma, the pharmaceutical industry's approach, which is just to throw darts. Instead, we want to go to them and say, hey, we think patients with this are more likely to benefit from your drug and kind of do their work for them a little bit. So here is an example of a cold tumor, not a lot of immune infiltrating cells. This is an example of a hot tumor with the immune infiltrate. So we're using a big data approach. One of our new PhD students, she is now using over 
maybe 40,000 tumors that have this type of data, and she's mining that data with an algorithm. Once again, computer scientists love their algorithm names. Hers is called Rigatoni. Her, her parents are Italian. And it stands for something, I can't tell you what. So finally, uh, so not finally, the second topic I'd like to cover, and then we'll finish with telehealth, uh, is, is the implications of another gene alteration called fibroblast growth factor receptor. So this is a complex slide. These are all the ways we can now sequence the genomes of tumors, uh, and from a whole genome to just the genes, to some of the genes, to all of the genes. There are 20,000 genes in our genomes now. Uh, their RNA, which represents their expressed material, uh, we can detect all manner of alterations. Uh, one of the things we discovered uh, many years ago uh, in 2013 were something called gene fusions, where a, a gene could break in half and reassemble. And so each of these puzzle pieces represents an FGFR or a receptor, uh, FGFR2, FGFR3. Each one of these fusion or chimeric products of a new gene has a gain of function. So this gene is turned on, and it's not supposed to be on, and that's the reason why cancers with these gene alterations in FGFR grow. And now uh, we have smart drugs uh, to treat them. So again, a, a genome feature that's a vulnerability. These genes are on, cancers are growing. Where does it happen? How do we detect it? How do we get treatments to patients? And how does it work? So again, back to our model of a one-size-fits-all for liver cancer or bladder cancer to can we choose therapies based on genetics of those patients. So we went back to the drawing board. How are we going to detect these gene alterations? In 2013, we did not have the proper tests to do that. This was a novel discovery. There wasn't a tool on the shelf to do this. Uh, so this is a schematic of a gene, gene B, breaking and then coming back together. And so we sought to develop an RNA sequencing based approach to detect this because we thought that would be the simplest way to do this. Uh, again, this is a fusion or a chimera. So again, Julie again developing another diagnostic test uh, for gene fusions. Uh, this one's called Spark Fuse. Uh, so as a medical oncologist, all these tests are kind of not my realm. And, and I've, been, I've been fortunate to be able to partner with laboratory diagnosticians, genomic scientists, and computer scientists to work together to bring new ways to, to diagnose cancer. So we defined all the requirements to do this test. Uh, and now, that was in 2017, so most commercial companies you now test with for your cancer patients are beginning, if not already, incorporating an RNA-based approach as part of their testing. And so this is one of the cancer types that we now use FGFR inhibitors for, uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, this is a waterfall plot. Uh, so once again, each box is a patient. Uh, the box going up means the tumor is growing. Boxes going down, you can see there are a lot of boxes going down. This dotted line means that the, the tumor shrinkage was at least 30%. So most patients were benefiting in this clinical trial of almost 120 patients with FGFR positive cholangiocarcinoma. So today, even though we know that FGFR occurs in many cancer types, uh, these are the few cancer types that we have drugs approved for. There are about 1,000 patients a year with cholangiocarcinoma who have an FGFR gene mutation. Uh, there's probably a few more patients with bladder cancer who have an FGFR mutation. This is probably a disease of about 20 patients a year, 8P11, very rare blood disorder. So how do we get more drugs to all the other patients who have FGFR alterations? And one of the problems is the rarity of, of these findings. So if you start to take a cancer and, and dice it up into smaller pie wedges, it makes it hard for drug development to happen. It makes it hard for the pharmaceutical industry to see an opportunity to profit from that drug development. So it's d deterring drug development for these patients. So these are cancer types. These are FGFR genes, one, two, three. And all these patients have genomic alterations that we could potentially treat. So how do we reach all these patients? 
So over the past couple years, we've had what we call basket trials, where instead of focusing on one cancer type, we allow patients with any cancer type who have an FGFR gene to join. So it doesn't matter what cancer type you have. In these past 10 years, we've now seen five patients, there's four shown here, with a very rare pancreas cancer. So pancreas cancer happens in about 60,000 patients a year. And we now think that around 0.8% of those pancreas cancer patients in a year may have an FGFR fusion. Uh, on the uh, graph here, uh, each row is a patient. And then the most important part of this diagram is the x-axis, which is in years. So if you've ever cared for or know somebody with metastatic pancreas cancer, we usually don't talk about treatments for metastatic pancreas cancer in years. And so right now we continue to treat uh, at least two of these patients who've had multiple years of benefit from an FGFR drug. Each blue block of time is an FGFR drug and it's interspersed with some of the standard chemotherapies. And so this is a paper that we've uh, submitted uh, for publication. And, and as we observe this, uh, we are trying to develop uh, a trial to treat these patients. And the challenge, again, is there are probably 500 patients a year. So how do we convince a drug company to do this? And if it wasn't for COVID, we probably wouldn't be talking about this. So one of the lessons we learned, and many of you have seen this, how, how are we gonna deliver care in the midst of the COVID pandemic? And we've gotten through that and we've learned some things. And many of you have used telehealth and telemedicine to continue to care for patients, even give chemotherapy. Um, I, I remember giving Fulfirinox chemotherapy uh, through telehealth visits. Well, not through, but doing the care through the visit. So, uh, some of the lessons from precision oncology is that the genetics of cancer is not as common as we think. So, the things like ERB2 in uh, breast cancer, EGFR in lung cancer are quite common for those common cancers. But when you come down to other cancer types, you're talking about very small groups of patients who we are struggling to develop novel drugs for. So they're never gonna be 15 to 20% of a cancer type. It's gonna be a percent of cholangiocarcinoma, a percent of pancreas cancer. And before telehealth, we'd probably just leave that alone. And now um, we can do that. And so with these rare cancer types, there are challenges. How do you find the patients? How do you uh, find the resources to run those clinical trials you have to open 150 clinical trial sites worldwide to find enough patients for some of these things. So, so, so the pharmaceutical industry hasn't wanted to do that. So one of the patients that we met, uh, I, sh I shared with you on that slide, is a guy named Doug. We were able to treat his pancreas cancer for two years with an FGFR drug. Uh, and we met him once in Ohio, and the rest of the time we helped manage his care in Florida. And so he was another inspiring moment like Rhonda. If we can do telehealth with, with Doug, why can't we do this for FGFR positive pancreas cancer anywhere? And so, so we pitched this idea um, with a lot of uh, silence from drug companies, but one of them listened and one of them wants to do this, which is exciting. So what are the barriers to a clinical trial? Am I gonna be a guinea pig? Am I getting placebo? Do I lose my trusted doctor locally? How is this gonna be paid for? Is this expensive? Does the trial require extra work for the physicians involved? Will this trial really benefit my patient? Or is this just another guinea pig uh, for your trial? The, the likelihood of you benefiting is very high. You're not gonna get a placebo. You don't lose your trusted doctor. You don't have to travel. There's so many pluses to delivering a trial through telehealth. Uh, and we're really excited to be able to offer this. So we're partnering with a number of diagnostics companies that are routinely testing 20,000, 30,000 patients a year. We'll work with them, as well as the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, to find patients who could benefit. We'll offer them our telehealth trial. They don't have to travel. They do all their testing locally. We work with their local oncologists to get certain things done. The drug is shipped. They get a vial. They ship it back to us. That's it. Uh, there are a lot of regulatory steps, though. I made it sound a lot easier than it is. <laughs> um, we have so much inertia not to do this. 
when it comes to the regulatory process of doing a clinical trial. But none of that inertia makes sense. Every one of these steps that I've listed here, if I say, why can't we do it? No one can give me an answer other than, well, that's just not the way we do it. And so we've worked through many of these steps already. Uh, there are a few more steps to go through. But we think this is a new way to do clinical trials. Now, in this instance, we're talking about an oral therapy already approved for another cancer with relatively few life-threatening problems, right? It's, a, it's something we can manage. So I think this is a good prototype for a telehealth clinical trial, but I think this can help us pave the way for other novel therapies as well. So the last thing I'll, I'll uh, close with is one more patient. Um, I, I think you're starting to realize that patients inform research and most importantly, that research should inform how we care for those patients as well. So here's another patient that we were able to learn from. Uh, he had cholangiocarcinoma or a liver cancer. And uh, initially, uh, we, while we found an FGFR gene, we had a hard time convincing him to do chemotherapy. And he eventually did. Uh, so here's his chemotherapy uh, called gemcitabine and cisplatin. Uh, you can see his cancer throughout his liver. He had a nice response to that treatment. Uh, you can see some calcification. The tumors have shrunk. Um, but even after responding to the chemotherapy, the idea of chemotherapy was not good for him. He just didn't want to do it. And so we came off the chemotherapy, even though it was working, and we switched to an FGFR drug, the same kind of drug we're trying to develop for pancreas cancer. And he continued to respond. After about 12 months, his cancer grew. And because we sort of abandoned the chemotherapy early on, we now had gained his trust, and we said, hey, let's try the chemotherapy again. And remarkably, he had a response again. So throughout his two years of treatment, he gave us buckets and buckets of blood for research. And he never knew why. He was part of our study. He said, do whatever you want. And so we were able to develop a new blood test for FGFR, and we learned something. And so throughout his treatment, here's his chemotherapy. The blue is his FGFR gene fusion that we monitored in his blood. And you saw it go down. He received an FGFR drug, a smart drug. You see it go down to undetectable. And now he's on an FGFR drug in our trial. And then here, besides the blue color, you start to see some rainbow colors rise. These are the mutations that are arising that drive drug resistance to FGFR drugs that we now know about. And he actually developed six of them. So he's starting to manifest resistance against the drug. And then clinically, he shows resistance when he do a scan a couple months later. And so at this point, we said, hey, you know, we sort of didn't exhaust our chemotherapy. Let's try that again. And what's remarkable here, not only did it work, it actually worked against his resistance mutations. So I never had to do a biopsy to find out. I could monitor that from his blood. And so you can see the blue, uh, the, the other colors besides blue get deleted by chemotherapy. So what, what this tells us is that the chemotherapy can work against the cancer when it becomes resistant to FGFR drugs. And the FGFR drug could potentially still work, we already knew that, after chemotherapy. So why are we doing this to exhaustion? Why do we do this till it just stops working? Why don't we do this like we did for this gentleman and go back and forth? But instead of going back and forth because we have to, let's try doing it on purpose. And so that's what we're doing. So we have another clinical trial we're developing, again, starting with a patient, an observation, and how can we help more patients? Uh, again, this is using genetics. This is using computer science from the blood. Uh, this is connecting that to the clinical story. And so we're going to use blood testing, we're going to use CAT scans, and every patient will get chemotherapy plus another drug, uh, which is new, uh, and then alternate every two months between the therapies. And our goal is actually not how long they live and how well they do. Our goal is we know the therapy is going to work. Our goal is actually minimizing the side effects. So if you're on chemotherapy for a year, you feel it. If you're on an FGFR drug for a year, you feel it too. But if we can go back and forth, like we observed with that gentleman, 
his side effects got better when he switched therapies. And so I, I think the, the, the usual outcomes that we're gonna look at, but I think the outcome that I'm really excited about is, is minimizing uh, uh, side effects from cumulative therapy uh, and quality of life measures as well. So uh, we've covered three topics, microsatellite instability, you never wanna miss it. The opportunity for treatment is huge. Uh, FGFR, we are now starting to see multiple cancer types emerge that have it. We need to find better ways to offer them therapy and prove it works and get these drugs approved. There's also new therapies uh, emerging. And then finally, uh, telehealth. It, it, besides mRNA technology for vaccines, which is a huge accomplishment and something we learned from COVID, among other things, I think telehealth is something we can now use uh, for our patients with cancer. So really excited to share this with you. Uh, again, ver ver I'm so thankful for, for this lectureship. Uh, it means a lot for you, for you to invite me here to be here. Uh, and uh, I hope through research like this, we're gonna bring hope uh, on behalf of all, of all of you. So thank you. How do, how do people get connected with you and your lab because you're doing some really advanced stuff and when people know um, patients that have failed therapies and have that opportunity? Yeah, 734-474-8359. Uh, Call or email. My email is public. My office number is public. You know, we're very happy to help uh, with any of these types of cancers, rare cancers, complex genetic findings. Um, again, one of these findings that we learned about was from a oncologists reaching out to us about their patient with a finding that connected to our research and started this path for structural variations uh, and now Brigatoni, right? Um, so you never know what you'll find when, when you reach out to us. If you have a patient with um, stage four cancer that uh, responds to the immunotherapy, the immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, how long, if they achieve a complete remission, how long do you continue the therapy and if you stop at a certain point and they relapse, do they have a good chance of responding again? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, when you achieve a complete response, I mean, you can't detect anything on scans, that's pretty special and remarkable. And the likelihood that's going to be a sustained, hopefully long sustained response is high. Um, and so as long as those patients can tolerate the therapy, we try to continue that therapy, depending on the cancer type, for at least two to three years. And you know, I'm willing, since I've seen the complete response, to push them through. Uh, fortunately, a lot of patients tolerate these immune therapies pretty well. Uh, sometimes they can have some side effects that can sometimes be managed, sometimes not. But we like to try to push them through. Um, now, if they relapse or recur afterwards, uh, depending on how long it's been, sometimes they can be Rechallenged, and it could be the same therapy, or it could be the addition of another agent. For example, uh, a drug for PD-1 could be combined with a drug for CTLA-4. It could be another immunotherapy trial. Uh, over half of the trials that we have are actually immunotherapy. Uh, so if they've had a complete response before, I, I would definitely be aggressive about challenging their immune system to, to go after their cancer again. One of the, the fun things I get to do today is that my PhD was in immunology, and I went away from that for a while to genetics, and now genetics has brought me back to the immune system too, so, uh, so it's fun to be able to do that. So. Thank you. Uh, can you please uh, make a comment or two about uh, artificial intelligence and the effect of immunotherapy in terms of uh, improving that uh, with the treatment that you mentioned? Yeah, it's a really good point. So uh, artificial intelligence is showing up in our lives in many ways. Um, perhaps when you go to order something from Amazon, there's some artificial intelligence determining what they're gonna show you next. Uh, in cancer research, especially with genetics, we're starting to do the same. So our, our PhD student, Raven, uh, shown here in the back, her algorithm, uh, Rigatoni, is using a form of artificial intelligence called machine learning. And so we have a lot of biases when we do research. So you search for what you want to search for, and you look for what you want to look for, and you know what you know. And so her approach, a machine learning approach, using genetics data 
using hot and cold tumors is to find genes that associate with hot tumors. But she doesn't care what the genes are. So most immunology researchers are looking for immunology genes, genes that we know are part of the immune system. But what if it was a gene that was related to metabolism that you didn't know had an effect on the immune system in cancer? And so that, that's one example of how artificial intelligence is making an impact. There are many examples in the computer science world uh, with big data. Uh, so that's a definitely exciting opportunity. But I think a key aspect of that is integrating that into the, the cancer research that is happening. We want these teams communicating. And so our computer science team is, is housed right in the middle of the rest of our research team. We're all in one place together. So you, you can walk down to their office and chat about data and chat about questions. And I think that's one way you can create opportunities for aha moments. And so AI has huge potential, but if we don't connect our AI scientists to other scientists and other disciplines, it's not gonna take us anywhere. So but I'm looking forward to what we're gonna learn through Brigatoni. I just like saying that. Thank you. You said your, your goal was to try to bring some hope to the crowd, and I think certainly you've done that. Uh, Norton Cancer Institute obviously works across the country with lots of big programs and trying to bring patients onto trials. We are here in Louisville. If we have a diagnosis or we have a family member, are we routinely doing these types of genetic screenings? And then how can we get into trials? I mean, you've given us your phone number. You don't want me to call you. But are the providers in the Norton Cancer Institute routinely doing genetic screening across the board? And are we connecting to big programs to get patients into trial that need it? Yeah. So we're, we're fortunate tonight in the back of the room, I'm all embarrassed, but Dr. Al Martins here can speak probably. Do you mind, Al, just speaking of it? Will you get the microphone to Dr. Martin? He's actually ahead of you. Oh, great, great. Thank you, and I very much enjoyed your talk. So we do do routinely um, MSI testing, MMR testing. Uh, we reflexively do that so that whenever there's a certain tumor type that comes through Norton, from Norton Healthcare, the pathologists order that testing so it's always available for the oncologist. If the oncologist wishes us to do that on a type that we don't routinely test for, uh, we are happy to do that as well. We routinely reflex with immunohistochemistry and the MMR. And then, of course, when we do next generation sequencing, we'll get that as well. This is going to be in relation to the telehealth barrier that you mentioned about the licensing. Um, of course, during the pandemic, um, a lot of um, uh, new telehealth came to light across state lines through Medicare, for instance. I think the rules became slightly more relaxed about Medicare and telehealth. Do you? foresee the, a time when you could establish a situation where oncologists could use telehealth nationwide, kind of like a VA doctor whose um, license is recognized in every state? You, you know, that, that is a great question. Why does my Ohio license not apply here? That's the question you're asking, and, and there's no reason for that. And so for this trial, in a brute force way, to just get past that barrier, uh, myself and a fellow, Dr. Rish, we're just going to get licenses in a bunch of states. <laughs> Good. Literally, we're going to spend $40,000 getting licenses because we want to show this works, right? That's the only way we can do it without have, having, you know who, who it's going to be? It's one of our risk management people whatever, that's a lawyer whose job is to make sure our institution is safe from, from lawsuits. And we would be at risk. Um, but the question is, why does Ohio license not work in Kentucky? There's no reason for that. The, the, the boarding requirements are really no different. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I gave you my answer to how we're going to temporarily overcome it for this proof of concept trial. <laughs> 